Today, many people celebrate Children's Day. I would like to seize this occasion to talk about a group of children not many people talk about. Severely and terminally ill children, like my little sister, Valentina. Valentina was a bonus child. When she was born, I was already 12 years old. And as it often happens with these little ones, she was quite spoiled and received a lot of attention. So she was healthy and strong, inside and out. At least, that's what I thought. Until one evening in April 2015, when Valentina was 12 years old, my dad called me at 10 p.m. Back then, he never called me, especially not, especially not at 10 p.m. So I already sensed something was wrong. When I picked up the phone, there was a brief silence. Then my dad said, today we've taken Valentina to hospital, to the University Hospital of Ulm, to the Pediatric Oncology Department. With my then 24 years, I had never had anything to do with illness or hospitals, so I had no idea what he was talking about. So he explained that Valentina had cancer. It was a complete shock, as if someone had pulled a rug from under my feet. Childhood cancer, that's something you know only from sad pictures with pale, bold children, something that happens to other families no one knows, but certainly not to your own. But it was our new reality, and it hit us fast and with full force. Valentina had developed a bone tumor three children in one million get every year. It's more likely to be struck by lightning than to get this tumor. And yet she had somehow cracked this horrible jackpot. The tumor had already split her hip, so she had to be in a wheelchair, and the treatment had to be started right away. Her chances of survival lay at 20%. When I went home for the first time, I was absolutely terrified. I had no idea how to cope with, with the situation. I didn't know what to say or do, how to behave in front of her or my mom. On my arrival, my dad gave me a bottle of disinfectant because from then on, everybody who came to our house had to disinfect themselves from top to bottom and put on a surgical mask in case they had a cold because Valentina's immune system was so weak. I went up the stairs, and she was already waiting for me. And when I saw her, I got a brief shock, because there was a little ghost. Valentina had lost so much weight. She had no hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, and she was really pale. And yet, the moment we embraced, I realized that she was still the same lovely and beautiful girl that she had always been, even if she looked different and the situation was disastrous. Despite everything, Valentina kept her chin up, and she was so happy and so full of positivity and appreciation for each and every single normal day that it was an absolute pleasure to spend time with her. She went through six cycles of heavy chemotherapy, only to find out in September that the tumor had changed. It was now growing despite chemotherapy. The treatment was broken off, and her chances of survival dropped to 1%. And even then, she did not give up, and she did not despair. Instead, she demanded for new weapons in the fight against the tumor and took part in a pharmaceutical study to seize even that last 1%. On Christmas, it became clear that this treatment had failed too. We spent one last very beautiful holiday in Italy with our uncle, and we celebrated her birthday, her 13th birthday, which was to be her last. In April, the tumor attacked Valentina's lungs, and from then on, 
She always had to have a 30 kilo oxygen barrel with her at all times. And even then, she was such a fighter that she managed to spend a whole day without this barrel to celebrate her 13th birthday with her girlfriends. And in the evening of that day, her best friend said to her mom, Valentina is going to be fine. She was so happy, so strong, she's going to be okay. One week later, Valentina died in the University Hospital in Ulm. The day she died was my 25th birthday. And I'm very grateful for that. Because we did have a very special connection that sort of culminated in that day, which will be forever ours. When Valentina died, my family and me did not want to despair. If we had despaired, we would have granted the tumor an even greater victory than it already had. Besides, we wanted to give Valentina the respect that she had earned. At the age of only 12 years, she had to go through inconceivable pain and suffering and face her own death. And yet she was always happy and positive. So how could we dis despair? What's more, I thought to myself, if I let myself fall into grief now, I will never have a reason to come back up. Because when will the point come that I have grieved enough for my little sister? I think I will never have grieved enough for my little sister. I will always miss her and she will always be with me. So as I would never have a reason to come back up, I did not let myself fall. Instead, my family and me founded Stiftung Valentina in order to carry on Valentina's spirit and to help other severely and terminally ill children. And that's in no way a strategy to choke our feelings or distract ourselves. On the contrary, each and every day, we are encountering Valentina anew, and we are actively carrying on her legacy. With Shifting Valentina, we are tackling the problems we encountered in the course of the year we had with her. When Valentina's life came to a close, she opted to die in hospital, because she felt safer there than at home. And this made us realize the incredible gap we have in our healthcare system. No child should have to die in hospital. Especially not given the fact that since 2007, each and every person in Germany has the right by law to peacefully die at home and receive mobile palliative treatment to be free of pain. But laws like this are pointless if there aren't the structures to implement them. And right now in Germany, no mobile pediatric palliative team can work without significant financial support from sponsors, private sponsors. In Ulm, for example, where Valentina was cared for during her illness, a, child, a, day, a, child, a, a sick child receives um, a daily rate of more than 1,000 euros to be cared for in hospital. And the same child receives a daily rate of 66 euros to be cared for at home. This does not make sense. And the problem is that this situation is hard to change because when you have a sick child at home, you do not have the time or the nerve to fight for this child's right to die at home. And when the child is dead, it doesn't matter anymore. And this, the fact that Valentina had to die in hospital, isn't the only impact this gap in the healthcare system has on people. In the year of Valentina's illness, my mom commuted 35,000 kilometers just to be with Valentina. Because my parents live in a tiny city or town in the very south of Germany, which is 100 kilometers away from the hospital. So every time there was an emergency, every time Valentina's immune system broke down, which usually happened at 11 in the night, we had to get everything, child, medical equipment, overnight stuff, wheelchair, crutches, and in the end, the barrel, 
into the car and then race at full speed over the motorway to get this horribly sick child into safe hands as quickly as we could. And that was absolutely nerve-wracking for everybody. Professor Daniel Steinbach, head of the pediatric oncology department at the University Hospital in Ulm, also found the situation unacceptable. That's why, against all odds, he founded a mobile pediatric palliative team called Palicure. The team covers the whole rural catchment area of the University Hospital Ulm. That's seven rural districts. In the beginning, the team, as they receive no funding from the healthcare system, they initially covered this whole area in their private vehicles, completely understaffed and with almost no equipment. But the team is very dedica dedicated and their work is really important. That's why we with Stiftung Valentina are now trying to gather the financial means to make their work possible. Valentina has showed us that nothing is to be appreciated more than the value of each and every day. Anything that makes these children's lives even the tiniest bit easier is worth every cent and every effort. I would like to conclude this talk with a quote from Viktor Frankl. He was a Jewish psychologist who survived concentration camp. And while he was in concentration camp, he said that when we find ourselves in a disastrous situation of any kind, we need to stop asking ourselves, what do I now have to expect from life? And instead ask, what is life expecting from me? Instead of looking for the meaning of life, we should rather realize that life is asking us questions each and every day, every moment, every hour. And we have to find answers to these questions, not by a profound reflection, but by acting and behaving in a good way. Because life, after all, means nothing else than to take responsibility for finding good answers to the questions of life. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.